is Zainab Shinkafi Bagudu. I'm a pediatrician, I'm a mother, I'm a politician's wife, but most important of all, I am a cancer advocate. I found and I run the Medicaid Diagnostic Center as well as the Medicaid Cancer Foundation, which is based here in Abuja. Our theme today that we've been asked to talk about is ricochet, that is propelling oneself. Um, today, I want to talk about a lady, a fighter called Ekaiti. I'm going to take you through her story, and I hope that as I go through that story, you will be able to decipher which of my um, qualifications I'm wearing. Ekaite, some people might call a cancer patient, but I choose to call her a cancer fighter. She's a fighter because her story is very unique in many ways. About three years ago, she found a lump in her breast. When she found this lump, she went to a doctor in a top hospital here in Abuja. The first thing that was done was the doctor reassured her and told her it was fine, she should go back home. So she did. When she went home, the lump continued to bother her. She went back to the same doctor in the same clinic three times. Eventually, she was sent for a breast scan. She was sent to Medicaid, that is our center. The scan said her lump was normal, so she went back home. However, it continued to bother her. And most of all, the lump was now becoming painful. So she went to a tertiary hospital. At the tertiary hospital, the doctor took one look at it. This is a more experienced, more senior doctor. Took a look at it and said to her, this must be cancer. However, go for a test. She had a mammogram, which was the right test for her to have. She was 44 years old. And she also had a needle biopsy. I wish I could say that from there on everything went on fine, but then there, there would be no reason for me to stand here and talk to you about Ekaite. She didn't get her results for at least three months. Why? The first biopsy went missing. She went back, they looked for it, they couldn't find it. She had to have another test done. Eventually, about three months after she had been to the tertiary unit, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. The positive result came back, and she was told that she has breast cancer. Of course, she did what most of us in, I, I didn't mention to you her background, sorry. Ekaite was, at that time, 42 years old. She's an architect, a professional, a mother, a wife as well. So she had a fairly decent background. She was well exposed in terms of today's life. But she rejected it. The doctor that eventually read her results to her gave her her file and said, go to the oncology unit and get an appointment. She didn't do that. She went to oncology, dropped the file, and went back home. She was still married then. She told her husband, uh, this is what they said, but I reject it. It's not my portion. She went instead. She had faith. And so she stood with her faith and went for deliverance. Deliverance didn't make the lump go away. She felt good, but um, the lump didn't go. It was there, it was getting bigger, it was getting painful. What next? She still didn't want to go back to hospital. So she found a healer. This was a Nigerian alternate doctor that practiced Chinese-based natural remedies. He took her through various courses of herbal Chinese medication, as well as um, electrical therapy. She said when she puts her leg, when she was explaining it to me, when she puts her leg on one of the machines in particular, nobody could touch her. If you touch her, you'd get a shock. So here she was with a combination of her faith and her Chinese medicine. Lump was still there. So her husband now supported her in terms, in the sense that he convinced her to go back. Why don't you go back to that place you went, the teaching hospital, where they said you should go and get an appointment. Go and try and get an appointment and see an orthodox, proper doctor. So she went back. 
by this time she had spent quite a lot of money uh, out of pocket, of course, uh, on her alternate Chinese therapy. She went back to the hospital, they gave her an appointment, she saw the oncology department, they explained to her exactly what it entailed, the treatment, they would have to give her rounds and rounds of chemotherapy. If the lump melts, then they would think about taking it out and all that. She was working, she was an architect and a top executive with the FCDA. So she went to her workplace. And um, at the time, the doctor told her that she would need about maybe 8 million naira. But by the time she went back, and the, her, work to, her workplace asked her to get it all documented, the figure that they gave to her on paper was 15 million naira. It wasn't that they had inflated it. I'm talking about a teaching hospital. It's quite reputable, and making a profit is not their, their aim at all. But just by listing everything that she would need down and adding it all up, she would need about 15 million naira. Anyway, Kaite was fortunate enough to have some money. Her workplace didn't give her the money, but she started her rounds of chemo. She went through six rounds of chemo, and then she went back to her doctors, who told her that this lump is not moving. It's not changing. We're going to have to remove it. We have to take out the breast. Again comes in her rejection. Nobody is going to touch my breast. So she starts to search for alternative solutions. She went to an Indian hospital, and off to India she was shipped. She was quite pleased to get to India. They did a few more tests for her. But she was a very articulate lady, very, very organized, and everything she told me was well documented. So she showed me her list of drugs and what they did for her in India. There was really no difference from what had been done in Nigeria. They juggled her chemo in maybe a little bit of different way. And the only other difference was that it was cheaper for her. While around here was costing her about 400,000 Naira, in India it was half that. So she's been through all these things. She had a few rounds of chemo there. There was some change, but the cancer had spread to her sternum, that's her chest and her jaw and they were not immediately ready to, do the, the, to take off her breast. It wasn't quite time yet. But she ran out of funds and had to come home. When she came home, she came home with her next rounds of, uh, for, of medication. She went to the same hospital, but this time her reception was awful. My colleagues in the teaching hospital started calling her Madame Fortis. Fortis is the name of the clinic she had been to in India. She was treated with disrespect and she was treated with disdain because she had gone outside to seek an alternative treatment or a better option for her health. She was left with the younger, inexperienced doctors and um, she did have her chemo there and her cheaper drugs from India. So, so far, we can see quite a few things going on with this young lady. She's been through a diagnosis of cancer, a misdiagnosis, a misdiagnosis, administrative ineptitude of a tertiary hospital here. Uh, even the, when the doctor thought fit, she, the first doctor she saw was a young, relatively inexperienced doctor. Even when she thought it fit to refer her, she referred her for the wrong test. An ultrasound scan is a test that will determine, uses the interface between sound and tissue to create a visual image. But the, at her age, her breasts are not dense enough for an ultrasound scan. She should have been sent for a mammogram. But she went on and eventually got a diagnosis. And then she fell into all the faith healing and into the, but she didn't, her faith wasn't blind. She had, she worked with her faith and she went ahead and sought orthodox medical help only to come back amidst this professional jealousy, if you like to call it that. So now she's back from India. And what do we see? This is a young lady that has been diagnosed with cancer. 
and she's spending out of pockets. The Nigerian health system, the NHIS, does not support the diagnosis nor the treatment of cancer. So people like her are left to treat, to screen, to treat themselves, to diagnose out of pockets. The World Health Organization recommends that each country, including governmental and private spending on healthcare, spends at least 54, 54 US dollars. In 2000 and 2013, the United States of America spent 8,233 US dollars. India, sorry, South Africa spent about 91 dollars. Egypt spends about 26. India spent about 12.6 US dollars. The Federal Republic of Nigeria spent 12.9 ahead of India. Yet, capital flight on healthcare to, is in favor of India. Nigerians spend half a million US, half a billion US dollars in India on healthcare every year. So, where is the hope for us? We, those of us that are born in resource poor settings like Africa are going to have to continue this vicious cycle until we start to base our health responses on our own experiences. As long as we continue to base our solutions on experiences of other countries, it's not going to work. About 20 years ago, when I first graduated, or I was still a relatively younger doctor. My mother, she's a very interesting person. She said to me, um, why do these white people have all these big, big diseases? Cancer, multiple this, multiple that. My reply to her then, and my view now remains the same. It is because they have been able to get rid of the lower things, in my view, like infectious diseases. Their health systems are strong, the resources are available, and the hygiene standards are high. In Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, we tend to allocate resources, but even those allocated resources mostly go to infectious diseases like HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. We have not been able to get rid of those ones. So what hope is there for diseases like breast cancer? How do I go around advocating every woman above the age of 40 should have a mammogram? A mammogram costs, at the very least, 25 US dollars. But each family is allocated about 15 US dollars, or spends about 15 US dollars. We don't have insurance, we spend out of pockets and whatever the government provides. If you're spending 15 US dollars and a bout of malaria costs five dollars to treat, what is left for the cancers? So my point is this, is there a place for us to start considering the alternative medical healing? The government of India supports alternative medical traditions such as the Ayurvedic medicine and other therapies. We cannot say that, I'm not saying that we should use just these as our basis. This is a lady, I've taken you her story. She didn't stay with just her faith, deliverance, and alternative medicine. She sought medical help. Ekaita is doing quite well today. She was going to come, but she opted out at the last minute. But um, she did a combination of both. Is it time for us to sit down and look at both? Really, I think so. We need to work with our faith. We need to have faith with work. The Bible tells us this, the holy books all tell us this. It is not, in my view, a kaite that is rejecting. It is the doctors that are rejecting. It is my colleagues and the professionals and the people that are trained that always stand and say, oh, she rejected, it is not her portion. Did that alternative medicine in any way prolong her life? We need evidence-based research. We need economically viable solutions, and we need culturally appropriate solutions. If we can stay and use all these means and put it together and work with faith in all aspects of our life, I think that we will be a much better country. 
um, my senior brother spoke at length about insurgency. It's the same thing, whether in health, cancer, insurgency, your daily life as you play, as you work, we need to have faith. And again, I repeat, not just faith, but faith with work and work with faith. Thank you very much. Thank you.